Welcome back to the concurrent session number two. My colleague Nicole Huntley and myself will be the session chair this afternoon for this session. Uh, it's our great honor to do this. We both are PhD students under Dr. John Patience. Speaking of John, he will be our first speaker this afternoon. I believe many of you know, uh, already know him. He joined Iowa State in 2008. He's a professor at um, Animal Science Department. He received his PhD from Cornell University, bachelor and a master's degree from University of Guelph. His program does research in the applied swine nutrition and energy metabolism, particularly fat and fiber. He also provides extension support to the Iowa pork uh, industry. Most recently, he's also looking at how diet composition affect gut health and growth performance. As a precursor to reduce the antibiotic use in the pig diets, John will share with us can diet be used to improve gut health and what role does water quality play in optimum pig performance? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patience. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I can't complain about getting the first uh, slot after lunch because I'm the one that set the program. So. <laughs> I can only complain to myself, but I'll blame it on my wife or the dog or somebody like that. Uh, but thank you so much for coming back from lunch. I have to say I was really impressed with uh, uh, the chef here at Sheeman and uh, the quality of uh, how they prepared the pork. Uh, they do a really, really good job here. We've had other meetings before and they, they do a great job of putting pork together. So the first part of my talk is going to be talking about diet and gut health, and then the second part I'm going to talk about water quality because we're, we seem to be getting a lot more questions on water quality lately, and so I thought we would share some information with you on that. But first off, we got to talk about, well, when we, we mentioned the, the phrase gut health, what do we really mean by that? And I can tell you that in academic circles, we dare not use that term because it is so imprecise that uh, we will be roundly chastised uh, by people who are working in this subject area. But certainly from a production point of view, we use the phrase gut health, and so I'm going to try to explain first off what do we mean by that. Well, health is the absence of disease, so we're, if we're improving gut health, then our goal is to reduce any disease that, is, that might be going on in the gastrointestinal tract. Now, how might we do this? There's really four different ways. We might do it through improved structure of the GI tract, i.e. improved barrier function, uh, improved uh, digestive and absorptive surface area, uh, or improvement in the mucosal layer that lines the intestinal tract, and which plays such a really important role uh, immunologically and, and otherwise. It might also be through improved function. So uh, improving gut health might be through improved digestion or absorptive processes. It might also be through improved microflora and trying to suppress pathogenic uh, organisms and try to elevate, relatively speaking, uh, commensal uh, bacteria. And it might also be in encouraging or facilitating an optimal uh, immunological response. Now, one of the things I'd like to point out in that slide is I use terms like improved, qualitative or relative, but not absolute and, and not really quantitative. And that's one of the challenges. We can't say this is the ideal microbiota, this is the ideal surface area, this is the ideal uh, barrier function. Um, so that's a, a challenge for us. It's always we're working in relative terms. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out as is, is I'm going through, I'm going to be showing some data that relates specifically to gut health but I'm also going to be giving performance data, uh, and in some, uh, uh, by itself. And we might impute that there's, uh, with the improvement in, in growth performance, we're getting an improvement in gut health, um, but we don't have any data to support that. And indeed, um, you've seen in historically lots of data on the improvements in the performance of pigs when they're fed certain uh, antibiotics that we know function in, in the gastrointestinal tract. Well, 
People have not necessarily measured changes in the gastrointestinal tract, but we assume that that's one of the things that that antibiotic might be doing. And we then tend to, when we're looking at certain products, might be assuming there's an improvement in uh, the gut, but we haven't specifically measured it. I want to talk about digestive function uh, as an example of how what we're measuring is not exactly necessarily what we think we're measuring. And so for any of you in the audience who have done a digestibility study, it's relatively straightforward. We feed the pig so we know what the pig consumes. We collect what comes out in the feces, and by difference, that is digested. However, what happens between the mouth and the end of the pig isn't all just digestion. There's fermentation, so some of what disappears and doesn't get included in the feces, but should be included as digested material, will be products of fermentation, and one of which is gases. And that doesn't contribute to the nutrient or energy balance of the pig. And another will be heat. Heat is generated by digestive processes, and that also, the production of heat will utilize uh, nutrient and, and uh, components of the diet. That has disappeared, but we can't assume that that has contributed to the energy or uh, nutrient balance of the pig. So I just use that digestive function because it's something we're more, maybe more familiar with, but the same kind of challenges exist in many of these measurements. We're trying to measure as close as possible to what we want to know, but in many cases, uh, we know that it's not exactly what we want, but it's as close as we can get. So can the diet be used uh, to improve uh, gut health? Well, of course it can, and we've been doing this for 40, 50, 60 years, and we've been using antibiotics. And so that uh, is an example of how diet can be used to improve um, uh, gut health. But we also, uh, for those of you that are formulating diets, you know that we use functional ingredients in starter diets. In other words, functional ingredients meaning they provide nutrients, but they do more than just provide nutrients. Uh, like lactose, starter diets almost always contain lactose or a replacement for lactose. We use zinc oxide because it has antimicrobial uh, function. Uh, we, when we're feeding, for example, a starter pig, we might avoid certain ingredients that have high levels of anti-nutritional factors because the impact they may have on gastrointestinal health and digestive and absorptive function. Uh, we might use ingredients that can break down those anti-nutritional factors. Almost every pig in this country, I think, is, has phytase in the diet at some phase, and, uh, and really all that phytase is doing is breaking down an anti-nutritional factor, which is phytate, to release the phosphorus so that the pig can utilize it. So um, let's talk then a little bit about some of the work on using um, the diet to improve gut health. I'm going to talk first about what's going on today, and then I'm going to look a little bit into the future. So the first slide, this is some data from Jesus Acosta, uh, one of our PhD students who has been looking at uh, starter diets and he's been looking at various components of starter diets and how they affect uh, gut physiology and function. In this particular slide, he is showing, um, he's looking at the effect of, yeah, of a fermentation product versus the control or lactose and then lactose and the fermentation pro, uh, product combined. And what he's showing in this instance is that when lactose was present, there's an increase in butyric acid. Well, we tend to think that we want to increase butyric acid production in the lower gut, in the colon, which is where this was measured, for a couple of reasons. One is we understand that butyric acid has uh, anti-inflammatory function. Uh, we also know that butyrate is a preferred um, fuel that will be used by colonocytes, the, the cells in the colon. So by, if we're increasing uh, butyric acid, we would consider that that's an improvement in, uh, in gut physiology and function. Jesus, in a different study, looked at the effect of a fermentation product or an antibiotic or the combination of the two together. And what we see here, uh, which we were frankly quite surprised by, but I guess that's why we do research, is that uh, there was really no response to the fermentation product. Uh, the response to antibiotic was not statistically significant, but when the two were combined in the diet, we got a statistically significant uh, beneficial effect. So in other words, the two together are more effective than each one by themselves. 
not only in terms of average daily gain, but also in terms of feed efficiency, and also in terms of the number of medications that had to be administered to the pigs individually. Uh, so that was a 30% reduction by using the combination of the fermentation product and the antibiotic. So here is another example of how we're using the diet to provide benefit to the pig, and we can suggest that the benefit is occurring in the gut, even though we didn't measure that specifically in this trial. This is an older study that we did a number of, of years ago. It was uh, feeding a, a, a yeast product uh, it called uh, Pilot, uh, produced by a company used to be called Vicor, now Arm & Hammer. And we were asked to titrate uh, this product, so at 0 0.01, 0 0.02, and 0.04% of the diet, and you can see there was no beneficial effect in terms of growth rate, average daily gain, average daily feed, or feed efficiency. However, there was a substantial drop in mortality. Now, a couple of points here. First off, this was the first time that I had done a study with a feed additive, a non-antibiotic feed additive, that had, had such an impact on mortality. This was, this was the first time, and at that time, about 35 years of doing research, so it was kind of interesting. The other point, and I'm going to bring this up later on in my presentation, is if we didn't have 7.5% mortality in the control group, would we have been able to pick out this effect? So this speaks to the question of when we're doing research on feed additives that we want to have a beneficial effect, under what conditions do we evaluate them? And how can we create those conditions? Because I can tell you, we have tried, most recently, but over time, trying to, to stress animals in order to put them under more pressure when we're evaluating certain ingredients, and it can be really hard to stress a pig. Now, for those of you who work in barns, you can say, hell no, it's pretty easy to stress a pig, but when we're trying to do it in research, for some reason, it can be quite, quite challenging. So I'd just like you to keep that in the back of your mind of the conditions under which the trial were run and how that impacts the outcome, and in this case, identifying an impact on mortality. Now we talked about any nutritional factors, and this was a study done by a former master student, Cassie Holloway, uh, and this is the level of uh, phytase that was measured at the terminal ileum, so before there's any fermentation, in 40 kilogram pigs, and as she increased the amount of phytase in the diet, the amount of phytate, we can also call it IP6, so an os inositol with six phosphates attached, is reduced in a curvilinear fashion. Uh, now let's take a look at this a little bit more closely and look at IP543 and an inositol which is the ring which forms the basis for phytate but now has no phosphates attached to it. And we can see that IP5 goes down uh, as we increase these, the superdosing of phytase. So that helps to reduce this anti-nutritional factor. Now when we look at IP4, um, we can see that it actually increases and then comes down, and IP3 uh, increases in a somewhat linear fashion. We think what's happening here is as we break down IP6 and IP5, it's not going all the way to IP0 or inositol, so we're seeing some of the lower level uh, inositol phosphates, but the red bars, which are intentionally brighter so that you can see them, is that we substantially increase the concentration of inositol in, uh, in the feces, or excuse me, in the ileal digesta, indicating the effectiveness of phytase in if we go to high enough levels to actually break phytate down completely. Uh, looking at digestibility, we saw no effect at the end of the terminal ileum, but there was a linear increase in total tract digestibility of dry matter uh, in the 60 kilogram pig. So we have a relationship between uh, breaking down of phytate and improvement in digestibility. Now, let's change gears and go a little bit deeper into measuring some of the things that are going on in the gut. This actually was a study uh, that uh, Chin Yung ha has done as part of her PhD. And since I was going to show data of hers in my talk, I knew she would give me a really nice introduction. So, and uh, plus she hasn't had her prelim exam yet. So, <laughs> Anyhow, 
So in this particular study, to explain the nature of the study, uh, Chin Young had what we call the negative control pigs. So these pigs were on the control diet, were not exposed to an E. coli challenge. The rest of the pigs here were all exposed to an E. coli challenge. The PC or positive control pigs were on the same diet as these pigs, but were exposed to an E. coli challenge. And then these pigs received uh, sugar beet pulp, which would be a source of highly fermentable and soluble fiber, or sugar beet pulp with an enzyme. And this would be DDGs providing an insoluble, very poorly fermentable fiber uh, without and with the enzyme. And when we look at the, uh, the odds ratio for the fecal score, so in this case, a higher score means less diarrhea. So our model worked because when we exposed the pigs, we had uh, uh, more diarrhea by fecal score. And interestingly, we got a significant further, uh, um, or it made, it made the, the diarrhea even worse here when we fed the insoluble fiber. Okay, so then when we go the next step and take a look at um, uh, E. coli shedding, um, I use that word we really easily, don't I, Chin Young? Okay? So the blue line again is the control, so there was no fe uh, E. coli shedding as there shouldn't have been. And then the red line is that positive control, so same diet but, without, or, uh, but with the E. coli challenge. And then the, uh, the black lines represent sugar beet pulp, and then the yellow line represents the, the uh, insoluble fiber, DDGs. And once again, we can see that the sugar beet pulp really didn't provide any benefit. Um, man, this is tricky. Um, uh, did not provide any, the soluble fiber did not provide any benefit, uh, but there was a benefit, uh, excuse me, there was uh, actually uh, more shedding of the, of the E. coli when we provided the, uh, the insoluble fiber. So we're starting to get a picture being built here when we use insoluble fiber and the impact that it can have. Chin Yung also looked at the, uh, the attachment of E. coli. So you can see within these yellow circles, you can see the E. coli that are attached to the villi. And, uh, and so attachment was greatest with the uh, control pigs that had received the, uh, the E. coli challenge, the pigs that received sugar beet pulp, however, had a substantial reduction in E. coli attachment. So perhaps the soluble fiber, the fermentable fiber, is providing benefit to these pigs. Interestingly, with the enzyme, uh, we did not see that benefit with sugar beet pulp. And we did not see any benefit uh, when we were feeding the uh, insoluble fiber or the DDGs. So we're starting to see a bit of a picture where soluble fiber might be potentially beneficial, insoluble fiber may be uh, deleterious, may have some beneficial effects um, as we look at some other data, uh, but we can see now how we formulate the diet, how this might make the pig more susceptible or resistant to an E. coli challenge. Um, and in this uh, study also by Chin Young, she looked at um, supplementing pigs with xy uh, xylanase enzyme or an enzyme blend, which was xylanase, cellulase, and, and yeah, a beta-glucanase. And so a smaller number, we're measuring mRNA here, so we're measuring the message uh, that produces the, the protein that we have an interest in. And so clodin-3, which is one of the proteins that's involved in the barrier function, uh, in the tight junction, was increased by the uh, enzyme blend. It was not affected by xylanase by itself. Interesting, uh, IL-22, interleukin-22, the cytokine, uh, the message for that was actually um, reduced uh, when in the enzyme blend. And interestingly, that enzyme blend also resulted in improvement in growth performance. So starting to see a relationship between structure and function in the gut and performance of the pig. Okay, so let's turn to the future. Um, we have a huge long list and you're as familiar, more familiar than I am with all of the potential additives that might be utilized in the diet of the pig to provide benefit from a, a gut health point of view. What does the future hold in terms of diet formulation? Well, in the future, 
I believe you're already formulating diets to some extent to address the health of the gut health in the pig by using things like lactose, by using um, um, other uh, products in the gut, and by reducing certain fibers that you know would be deleterious. So we're already doing that. I think we're going to be doing that much more. To a large extent, our diet formulation right now is, other than in starter diets, it's exclusively nutrient focused. Are we meeting the requirements for energy and all of the other nutrients that the pig requires? I think in the future, we're going to be looking at formulating these diets based on the potential challenges that these pigs are facing. If these pigs are exposed to swine dysentery, for example, Dr. Eric Burrow in the vet school has shown in a number of experiments now that if pigs are fed diets with higher levels of uh, DDGs, an insoluble and poorly fermented fiber, their susceptibility and, and the um, severity of swine dysentery is increased. So, uh, so an insoluble, poorly fermentable fiber is not a good thing to be feeding to pigs based on, on Dr. Burrow's uh, uh, research to pigs that might be exposed to a dysentery uh, challenge. Now, how are we going to how are we going to evaluate these products? And that's a real challenge. Many of you work for companies that have your own research farms and you can run growth trials. Uh, and so we're obviously looking for improvements in growth performance because that's what pays the bills. If we get faster growth, better feed efficiency, whatever, then that's a way that we can evaluate the economic impact of this product. So can I afford to feed this product? Does it make sense economically? But, uh, but the challenge is, remember going back to the earlier experiment where we showed the reduction in mortality? You know, we have to be careful how we interpret growth trials because um, is the circumstance in which we've run the growth trial the same circumstance in which we're going to be using the product in our commercial barns? And we know that typically pigs perform better uh, and in a different environment in even commercial research barns than they do in commercial barns. And so that's going to be a challenge for us. We should be looking for improvements in biological outcomes. And um, we're going to be starting a trial in, uh, in September where we're going to be again challenging pigs with E. coli. And there's a number of objectives in that trial, but one of them is to see if we can identify um, markers that can be used that are less invasive. We don't have to sacrifice pigs in order to look at the effect on gut physiology and function. So uh, Amy Petrie uh, will be uh, driving that uh, um, research. Sorry, Spencer will be. Pardon me, I got the wrong, uh, wrong experiment. So Spencer Becker will be doing that. Spencer comes from Kyoto. Ideally, what we'd really like to have is we get the improvement in growth performance and we also get the, uh, the beneficial effect in terms of biological outcomes, and those come together. That's when we're going to have the greatest confidence in using these products uh, in different circumstances. We're also going to ask the question of, what's the decision that we're going to use, uh, that we're going to make in terms of using uh, these feed additives? Is it going to be a binary decision? By that I mean we either use it and we use it everywhere, or we're not going to use it and we're not going to use it anywhere. Are we going to tie it to certain flows that we know have certain health challenges and apply additives under one flow situation but not in a different flow? Or are we going to do it on a farm by farm basis? Because one of the things we know for certain, I think already, is that these feed additives, um, they are much more specific in their beneficial effects than, uh, than antibiotics. Antibiotics had a beneficial effect that was fairly broad, whereas these products are going to be fairly specific can we afford within our, the way we operate our systems now to feed them in such a specific way? So that leads to the question, well, how are we going to deliver these products in the future? Logical way is through the feed. The advantage of doing it through the feed is that you have one person in the organization who is a, an authority on these feed additives and they can decide when the products can be used and what products should be used and where these products should be used rather than try to have the decision at the level of the farm where you'd have to train every farm manager or even service managers uh, to do it in a group basis. So there's advantages in doing it through the feed. I think there's probably a little bit more control if it's done at the level of the feed mill. Um, so there's some advantages to putting it in the feed, but there's some real challenges because we like to run our feed mills as efficiently as possible, and that means large runs. And if we're going to have a lot of different feeds in our system, that means we're going to have smaller and shorter runs. 
uh, delivery is going to be more complicated and that may create some problems. So we're either going to use these products more broadly than is probably optimum or we might look at going to the water. Now some of these products are compatible with water delivery but some aren't. So water would not, would not work. But the advantage of water is that if a problem arises you can get something into the water within a few hours. Uh, trying to make a change in the feed might take two or three days or longer. Uh, so there's, there's some, the advantage of immediacy, there's the advantage of providing the product specifically when it's needed for a specific purpose, uh, but there's some challenges there as well, and uh, that challenge is getting the right uh, concentration of the product, making sure that it's uh, uh, soluble in, in the water, uh, making sure that the uh, uh, that the medicator is functioning properly and so getting the right concentration can be a real challenge and when you think as we'll talk in the next part of my talk that a third or more of the water that goes through a nipple drinker is wasted then that means that a third or more of the product that you're feeding through the water is being wasted and if you're trying to get a specific daily dose of product into an animal you got to take into account wastage and that can be quite difficult to quite difficult to do um, so what does the future hold in summary? I think right now we're kind of picking away at the edges and we're making progress, but there's two areas where we have to make um, much more progress. We need to understand mode of action much better of these products and the family of products, and we have to understand their application in the field. That's really our challenge to using these products more effectively if we're going to be using less antibiotics or if we want to go to a production system where we're not using antibiotics at all. Um, diet formulation, as I said, will evolve from just being nutrient-based to being nutrient plus function-based. Um, I know that product development efforts are becoming much more sophisticated with this new generation of feed additives, so we can expect some uh, uh, higher level of science to be made available to us. Um, and while antibiotics may be uh, broadly effective, non-antibiotic feed additives working in combination with these antibiotics when required for health purposes might make them even uh, more effective. Okay, I want to break now and move into water in the last few minutes that I have. And um, I'm going to talk about water and water quality. First off, I want to differentiate between water intake and water disappearance. When we're measuring water, if you have a meter in your barn and you're measuring water uh, you're not measuring intake, you're measuring disappearance. If you're using well-positioned, well-maintained nipple drinkers, you're probably wasting about a third of that water. Now, I say wasting, meaning it's not going into the pig, it's going into the pit. And if you go to a system where you're not wasting that water, like wet dry feeders, and you don't have supplementary nipples, one of the complaints that we hear is that the manure isn't liquid enough and it's more difficult to handle. Um, and so, and the other thing I want to point out is if you're looking at increase in water flow or disappearance in hot weather, remember that the increase that you're seeing is not all intake because we know that pigs play with the nipple drinker much more when they're heat stressed than when they're not. And so, uh, in hot weather, water intake only goes up by oh, a quarter to three quarters, um, or let's say 15 to 75 percent, but waste may go up threefold, fourfold, or even more. And so those pigs will try to cool themselves off by playing with the nipple drinker. Where does water come from for the pig? Well, obviously drinking water, but I wanted to point out only about three quarters of the water that the pig receives on a daily basis comes from the drinking water. Uh, about 20% or a fifth of the water uh, comes from metabolism. Those of you that uh, remember your biochemistry, any oxidative process uh, results in the release of water. And so that's a significant source of water to the pig. And there's a little bit of water that comes in the feed because feed isn't 100% dry. In terms of output, only a little bit more than a half of the water which the pig excreted is excreted in the urine. Um, and that's easily measurable, uh, but a third of the water that a pig excretes, and this is under thermal neutral conditions, is excreted in the breath as evaporation. And so that's a very significant component of the elimination of water by the pig. And then there's smaller amounts are retained in tissue accretion and some is lost in the feces. 
Okay, I want to take a look at some uh, how uh, about water intake and how, in some respects, it, in the newly weaned pig, it seems to be their free choice intake seems to be uncoupled with what we would think their need is. And in this particular uh, study that was done quite a number of years ago, so this is water intake. Day one is the day after weaning and so on up to five days after weaning. This was uh, good quality water, fresh water, and this was water that had a substantial amount of sulfate in it. And we can see that immediately after weaning, pigs increase their water intake, whether it's because they're finding the nipple drinker, whether it's because um, it's a behavioral thing, or they're hungry and they're trying to uh, achieve satiety because they're not eating very well. But notice that water intake then drops and actually the scour score is increasing. So as diarrhea increases, water intake goes down. And that just doesn't make any sense at all. So that means that we have to, when we're managing newly weaned pigs, we have to be darn careful that those pigs have as easy an access to water as possible because they're not necessarily going to link their water intake uh, to uh, what we believe they need if they have diarrhea. And here's another example. Um, this study was done on a, on a commercial farm, and this is the water intake. Um, and the, uh, uh, the round uh, dots referred to good quality water, uh, and the uh, squares refer to water that's very high in sulfate, 2,300 parts per million of sulfate. And again, we see that same pattern, high intake, and then it declines. But notice the pigs with the high sulfate water, and they're going to have a lot of diarrhea. We'll come back to that in a minute. So diarrhea is going up, and water intake is going down. Just doesn't, doesn't make sense. So we have to be very, very careful about making sure that we allow those pigs to have as much water as they need. Sulfates is the, is the elephant in the room. It's the one that causes us the challenge. It causes an osmotic diarrhea. And so the challenge that you have as, um, as uh, working with people in the barn is that you can walk into a barn and you can just see the dirtiest mess of pigs that you ever see because they've got severe osmotic diarrhea, but they're probably performing fine. And I'll qualify that in a minute. But we, uh, um, but we know the intestine of the pig can handle sulfate very well. Physiologically, we did those studies. There's a specific transporter for sulfate in, in the intestinal tract. Um, it appears to not impair performance unless you get up to 2,000 parts per million or more of sulfate. Now, if you send water away for an analysis, it'll probably come back and say anything over 150 parts per million of sulfate is bad, but all of those standards that you will see in a water analysis are based on human evaluations, not on animal evaluations, and they're largely based on aesthetics, not based on, on health. If you have sulfate in the water, you may get a rotten egg odor if uh, certain bacteria are present. And, um, but the question is, and this is the unknown question, this is, I wish I could answer and I can't, and that is, if these pigs are drinking high sulfate water and have an osmotic diarrhea, does that increase their susceptibility to uh, gastrointestinal upset of some other source, to an E. coli diarrhea, to dysentery or whatever? And, I don't believe that experiment's ever been done. I haven't seen it published anyhow. That's the, that's the qualifier in everything that I, I'm saying. Here's some uh, studies on uh, comparing. In, we went out to a 1,200 sow. We had the opportunity to go out and run a study on a 1,200 sow, single site, fair to finish barn. This was the waters that came out of the well. It's pretty crappy, 1,650 parts per million of, of sulfates. It was largely calcium uh, and uh, sulfate with some magnesium and sodium sulfate. That iron, if you're familiar with uh, water assays, 14 parts per million iron is horrific and can cause all kinds of grief to you. Um, and uh, obviously with that many um, cations, it's gonna be very hard water. So let's take a look at performance. Trial started the day of weaning. Uh, it was, uh, pigs were weaned at about 21 days of age, 13 pens per treatment. The trial lasted uh, 35 days. Absolutely no difference in growth rate, in body weight, in feed intake or feed conversion. No difference. The people who were working in the barn did not believe our study because they said, there's the pigs that are getting good water and there's the pigs that are getting crappy water and look at the difference. You can see the difference in the pigs. Well, you could see the difference because they were dirty, but the scales I don't think lie. But we reran the trial um, just to answer the question for ourselves, 
and also for their benefit. And so basically the same trial repeated, no difference in final weight, average daily gain, feed intake, or feed efficiency. None whatsoever, and that's with 1,650 parts per million of sulfate. Um, this is a trial that Josh Floor did at K-State University, where they, uh, they created some water with 2,000 parts per million of sulfate. And in this instance, and it was largely sodium sulfate, you can see they got a drop in average daily gain, in average daily feed, and poor feed efficiency. That was one of the few studies that's shown a drop in performance. But Josh made a terrible mistake. And Josh is a really thorough scientist um, when he was doing his studies at K-State, and he repeated the experiment. And, you know, if you get the result you want, you never repeat the experiment, because he did. He lowered the sulfate a little bit down to 1,700 parts per million, but now no difference in average daily gain, average daily feed, or feed efficiency. Okay. So what's our water action plan? If you're dealing with a water quality problem, what do you do? Well, there's two step ones. I'm a professor, so I get away with saying there's two step ones. Step number one is you get your water sample and get it analyzed. Step number two is to, as much as possible, try to determine if this water really is affecting the performance of the pigs. Is it really an issue of performance and productivity, or is it one of aesthetics? And then the second thing is, based on the water analysis and your analysis of the second part, then you can decide what changes you want to make. Do you want to make changes in the diet? As a consequence of this, uh, do you want to put in a, a water treatment system? So I'm going to finish with an acknowledgement. I get to talk about my research, but there's an awful lot of people who are colleagues and we get to work with on our research. And as you can see, it's a pretty long list, our funders and our, uh, and our collaborators. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. And I ran out of time. Questions? Two um, minutes. Two minutes? OK. So. Sorry. Yeah. I see, yeah, the question was, do I see people actually making modifications to their feed formulations in response to water analysis? And the answer to that is, yes, I do. Um, but you have to be really, really careful, Chris. First off, if you're dealing with groundwater, groundwater is fairly consistent in composition. It's not likely to change over time. But if it's surface water, then because of runoff, that water can change. So you'd have to analyze that water very regularly. But if you have high sulfate in the water, so you've got a lot of sodium sulfate, you can remove or reduce the sodium chloride in the diet, but then you also got to analyze for chloride, okay? So you can reduce sodium intake, <clears throat> but if you don't take account of chloride, a deficiency in chloride will shut down feed intake in a pig just about as quick as anything. So you, if there's not a lot of chloride in the water, you got to come back and put something like uh, potassium chloride in the water to make sure the chloride requirements being met. That's a good question. Yeah. Thanks, John. Oh, last question. Yeah. So the, the question is, if, if we see water getting higher than 2,000 parts per million, is it a real problem or is it aesthetics? And I use the number 2,000 because I'm pretty confident that if it's less than 2,000, you probably don't have a performance issue. Okay? Um, uh, the Josh Floor's data is the only at 2,000 parts per million that showed any drop in performance. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other data to show there is no effect. Um, and I don't see very much water that is over 2,000 uh, parts per million. I do see, do you have water that's over 2,000? Oh, is that, is that yours? Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right on. We're gonna talk about that perhaps. Are you gonna stay for the barbecue? Yeah. Very good, so check, look me up and we'll talk about that then. Okay.